USDA set the bar extremely high with its 188.8 bushel per acre corn yield and 53.6 bushel per acre soybean yield in August. Hello Comstock Channel, analyst Brian Grady here and it's August 18th, that means it's Pro Farmer Crop Tour Week and since I have extensive background in running the eastern leg of the tour for many years, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a guideline and tutorial in terms of how to best use that data as it comes out throughout the week and there will be a lot of data coming out and I'll run through that and, and how to access it and, and all the other things. But the most important thing is just understanding how the data is collected, what the data means and how to best use that. And for that, I wanna run through the following steps. First off, what is Crop Tour? Well, Crop Tour runs the third full week of August each year across seven Midwest states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, eastern half of Iowa and southeastern Minnesota for the eastern leg, southeastern South Dakota, Nebraska, western Iowa, and the rest of southern Minnesota for the western leg. And then both of those legs meet up on Thursday of that week in Rochester, Minnesota for a final meeting. Now, there will be nightly meetings throughout the week to release tour results from each stop. And as you can see, here's the nightly schedule. So, Monday evening will be the results from Ohio and South Dakota. On Tuesday, it will be Indiana and Nebraska. On Wednesday, it will be Illinois and the Western crop districts in Iowa, one, four, and seven. Those run along the Western edge of the state. And the reason that it's only those is because the Eastern leg of the tour finishes up with the Eastern half of Iowa on Thursday and then into Southeast Minnesota while the western leg goes through the rest of southern Minnesota. And, and so those two states will be released on the final day on Thursday. Keep in mind that as we go through these numbers, it's best to compare to past years to get an apples to apples comparison. So what did these areas and routes find last year? And what did they find for the three-year averages from those respective routes. Now, a little bit more on the routes, and, and I probably should have started with this because this is important. The routes are predetermined, but the stops are not. So the scouts are asked to stop randomly roughly every 15 miles along predetermined routes. Uh, there are 11 different routes in the eastern side and 10 different routes on the western side. So like I said, those are predetermined. Where they stop isn't predetermined. And, you know, quite honestly, I can tell you firsthand that the crop tour has been accused of only picking the good looking fields, only picking the poor looking fields, both sides of that uh, over the years. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. It is just a random stop. And even if it wasn't, honestly, what looks good from the road isn't always what is the best when you get out into fields and, and pull samples. And what looks the poorest from the road isn't always what you get the poor fields when you get out in there and pull the samples and so it is purely a, a random stop at that point in time while there will be data released throughout the week i think it's important that you not get too much focused on individual stops and, and things like that keep in mind that these are individual samples from one spot in each field that is pulled. And over the course of the week, there will be roughly 16 to 1,700 corn samples pulled and the same number of soybean samples pulled. And, and so the best number at the end of the week is always the average of that total conglomerate. And that gives you one big corn field and one big soybean field from Western Ohio all the way through Nebraska and everywhere there in between. And, and that is always the best number that Pro Farmer puts out from the crop tour data. Now, if you wanna follow along, a lot of the scouts put it out on social media and this year's Twitter handle will be hashtag PFTour25. And so you can follow along there, pictures, data throughout the week. And, and so fully accessible, to the public for your consumption. Now, I mentioned the scouting procedure a little bit, but I wanna go through the sampling procedure. So when the scouts make the random stop about every 15 miles, they're instructed to do so with a corn and soybean field, uh, either across the road from each other, side by side, something in close proximity to just make the sampling easier because one group of the scouting team will go into the corn field and pull a sample. The other will go into the soybean field, pull a sample. That data will be tabulated, put into a spreadsheet via an app, and then at the end of the day, all those numbers are, are tabulated together. So we pull up to a stop. I'm going into the corn field. I'm going past the end rows. 
You want to get past the end rows, and ideally you want to enter the field somewhere around the middle. After we're past the end rows, then we're going to go another 35 paces, and we're going to lay out a 30-foot rope. We will take one of those rows and then one of the adjacent rows and count all the ears on that 30 foot. And then you're going from one of the rows, you're going to pull ear five, eight, and 11. Now on those three sample ears, number five, eight, and 11 from one of those rows, you're going to measure grain length in inches, nearest quarter inch there. You're gonna measure kernel rows around, and then uh, you're gonna record the row spacing. So the formula for the corn yield sample from that particular spot in the field is total number of ears times 0.5 times average of your kernel grain length of those three ears times your average of the kernel rows around and then you divide it by your row spacing. And you can see the example that's here on the screen for just a random made up number so that would be a, a representative sample of something that would be legitimate. With that said, like I said, that's a sample from that area of the field, one sample from each field. And that's why at the end of the week, the 16, 1700 samples all put together and averaged out is the best number that Pro Farmer comes up with. The other thing to keep in mind here is that the stops are random and can be anywhere in the field. You know, it can be the best spot in the field. It could be the worst spot in the field. You don't know when you're trekking into these fields. Trust me on that one. You have no idea. You're going past the end rows in another 35 paces and, and where you end up is where you end up. There aren't going to be many drown out areas this year, but in years when there are, if you your paces take you into a drown out area, you still lay out the 30 foot rows. And if there's zeros throughout that, it's a complete drown out. That would be a zero sample. You still have to record the row width on that from another area in the field to get a true sample, but it would be a zero. There won't be many, if any, of those this year just because of the extremely good growing conditions. Some of the fields are heavily populated and so they have more stocks and way more ear counts and some are lesser populated and, and therefore uh, they don't have as many. They also take into account the crop maturity, what the crop health is, soil moisture, those types of things as you go into the fields. Now on the soybean side, you don't need to traipse too far into these fields. Just pick out a representative sample. So if you look across the field and it looks like green carpet across everything, you want to just get past those initial rows and, and out a little ways into the field without traipsing too far. You're going to lay out a three foot section within that measure your row width, and then you're going to count the number of plants in that three foot of section. You're going to randomly pull up three of those plants. And when I did it, I told scouts, when I led the eastern leg of the tour, I always told scouts, just do the same method, whatever. I don't care what your method is. If you take the first plant, the middle plant, and the last plant within that three foot section, if you take the first three, the last three, if you just randomly pull whatever, do, do the same method every single stop. As long as you're consistent with your methodology, it doesn't really matter. After you have those three plants, you're going to count every single pod on all three of those that are in that area. And so let's say the first plant might end up with 100 pods and the second plant ends up with 120 pods and the third plant ends up with 140 pods that's pretty easy math and, and you'd have 120 pod average over those three plants conversely they could be much less than that and sometimes the biggest bushiest soybeans have the least number of pods and sometimes the smallest and meek looking plants have huge numbers of pods and, and so you can't really tell and, and that's why you average it up but your formula there then is going to be the total number of plants in a three foot area multiplied by the average number of pods and then you take that number by 36 and divide it by your row spacing and what that formula gives you is no matter whether the field is seven and a half inch row spacing or 36 inch row spacing or anything there in between, it's an apples to apples comparison. It gives you the number of pods in a three foot by three foot square. Pro Farmer does not do a yield estimate on soybeans going into and out of fields. They do that pod count in a three foot by three foot square. Much like I said with corn, the same type of situation compared to a year ago, compared to the three year average along that route and, and in that particular state crop district. All that is given to the scouts within a scout book before the week begins, and, and they're instructed to make apples to apples comparisons when they're posting on social media as well. Now, at the end of the week, that's Monday through Thursday data that will be released on a nightly basis on that schedule that I showed you earlier. 
At the end of the week on Friday at 1.30 Central Time, Pro Pharma releases its crop estimates. And there's some misconception on this over the course of time and actually every single year that Pro Pharma runs into this. The Pro Pharma estimates are separate from the crop tour data. They take into account the crop tour data. But as you saw on the initial slide, the green area here is the areas covered by crop tour. Everything outside of that is unsampled by crop tour. So as you can see, the state of Iowa is fully covered and it's the only state, uh, only one of the seven states that Pro Farmer gets into every one of the counties. The others have some areas that aren't sampled. So the Pro Farmer estimates on Friday take into account the crop tour data. They take into account areas outside of where what is sampled on crop tour, how they think the crops will finish, soil moisture conditions, the extended outlook out through the end of the growing season, those types of things, any acreage changes that may come into play, and all those other factors. There are many factors that go into those pro farmer estimates, but just keep in mind that they are separate. And the numbers that you see, let's say for Ohio on Monday evening, from the Pro Farmer crop tour data will be different than the number that Pro Farmer puts on that state for a yield. And I think that that's critical. There's always misunderstanding on that and, and a lot of questions about, well, on Monday you said Ohio was going to be this, and then on Friday you put the number at this. And that's absolutely right because Monday that's crop tour data purely going into the field, pulling samples, and, and the average of all those samples from the state of Ohio. On Friday, Pro Farmer takes that data along with all the other factors that I showed you there and talked about and comes up with their yield estimate for the state of Ohio. And that is the difference there. Also, Pro Farmer will do a yield estimate for soybeans for all seven of the states. And as I mentioned before, there is no yield calculation with the crop tour data. And that's largely because it takes a different number of pods to make a bushel in each of those seven states that are sampled during crop tour. Now that I've ran through the examples on, on how stops are made, how you get the data, the difference between the pro farmer data and the crop tour estimates at the end of the week, I think it's important that we hear kind of what we expect from tour leaders this year heading into crop tour. Well, I think first off, it's going to be a wet start to the day up here in South Dakota. Plenty of rain already this year, and it sounds like uh, when we hit the road in the morning, it's going to be raining as well. So this is a part of the world that if it makes good corn, it makes really good corn. This year, it's had the opportunity to do that. And I would suspect that that Southeast South Dakota is going to have some of the best corn in in the state of South Dakota. And we're also gonna make our way into Northeast Nebraska. The first day in Nebraska is always a very, kind of an eye-opening experience for us because we're gonna find out what's going on in the, the third biggest corn producing state in the country. So it's, uh, it's an important start for us as we get in Northeast Nebraska, make our way down to Grand Island. We'll start to get in to some of the irrigated corn as we make our way toward the, uh, the central part of Nebraska. So. It's a big day. It's the start of a discovery process out here on the crop tour. What do you think is going to be different this year compared to like last year? Yeah, last year, you know, third week of August a year ago, there was moisture in the ground. It was after crop tour that it just quit raining and, and we uh, dried things out in the central and the, and the western corn belt big time. It was a poor finish for both the corn and the soybean crop. This year, there's going to be even more moisture out there that I think than, than what we had a year ago. Everybody's been talking this crop up. Everybody has been talking about how good of a corn crop we, uh, we are looking at. And, and so we're expecting to find some good corn uh, on soybeans. You know, our pod counts a year ago were really, really good, but then it dried out after crop tour and we saw that bean crop go backwards. This year, I expect fact that we're going to see a really good pod count again on the on the soybeans and hopefully they'll they'll hold on to plenty of moisture and and finish that crop off this year anything else you want to add before we kick off it's pretty cool to gather again on a sunday night with a group of scouts we've got some very experienced scouts that are out here with us and we've got some first timers in uh, we're going to be learning from each other and going through the discovery process now after hearing that from chip I think it's important to put my spin on things and know that here throughout the week for Comstock subscribers, 
I will be providing my insights and analysis of the Pro Farmer Crop Tour data. And so you'll get a little bit of inside flair from someone who's got extensive background uh, with that data and, and the tour over the years. USDA set the bar extremely high with its 188.8 .8 bushel per acre corn yield and 53.6 bushel per acre soybean yield in August. Now, the tour isn't out to prove or disprove USDA per se, but the comparisons are inevitable, especially in a year like this. So the bar is set really high. At the end of the week, Monday through Thursday, will there be enough crop tour data to support those extremely high and record yield levels that USDA pegged the crops at to begin with in August? Or will they find some issues? Dryness, I know, is probably going to be a concern in some of the areas of the Eastern Belt. They've gone uh, through much of August without much rainfall, and, and their soil moisture is lacking in some of those areas, especially in the far Eastern Belt. So we're talking about areas of Ohio and eastern Indiana, and even some as you move west a little bit from there into western Indiana and, and some of eastern Illinois. Not quite as much, the further east. So uh, day one, that's probably where they're going to run into some of those dryness concerns. Crop diseases that we've seen. It's been extremely wet, especially in the western Corn Belt. So will scouts find evidence of white mold or other diseases that may show up in soybeans? The tassel wrap issue, how widespread was that? And, and is it a concern? Is it a major concern and enough to pull down the yields? And, and that's all analysis that Pro Farmer will put on their estimates at the end of the week as well. And, and so these are critical factors as we move forward. But know what the data is, know how to use it, understand the process, and I think you'll be much further ahead in the game than many of the people. You know, when you go out to social media, and, and I told you, hashtag PF2 or 25 will get you there. Some of the comments are just kind of crazy-ish. Why would we give this data away? Why why should the, the market know this data and stuff? Well, I'll tell you straight up that the market will know. And the market right now knows that the crop size for corn yield is 188.8. And for soybeans, it's 53.6. And they want to start adding or subtracting bushels from that based on what Pro Farmer sees. Now, there are many crop tours going on. Some have already been completed. And some will happen either simultaneously or after the Pro Farmer tour that are much smaller. Pro Farmer will have the second most samples only to USDA. Now, USDA goes out and they'll do their field sampling in September, October, November, and then they'll come up with a final estimate in January. Pro Farmer tour only goes through one time in the third week of August, but it's second only to USDA. Some of those smaller tours are, are more regionalized and they provide value as well. They pull a lot more samples from a smaller geographical area. So take all that data, take USDA, take Pro Farmer data, take some of those smaller, more regionalized, localized tours and start to formulate what the crop size is. Because I can tell you that's what traders are doing and that's what hedge funds are doing. And that's what everybody that's involved in all these crop tours is trying to figure out is what's the size of the U.S. corn and soybean crops, because it has an impact. It has an impact on everything from prices to what the outlook is, to basis, to grain movement at harvest time and ahead of harvest time and after harvest time and, and all those factors come into play. And that's why those scouts are out there doing their scouting this week, because they want to know, just like you and I, what the size of the U.S. corn and soybean crops is this year and to put a little bit more data on it after USDA has given us those initial estimates. For the Comstock Channel, I'm analyst Brian Grady. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.